Uh, so yesterday, if you went to Michelle's talk, you would have heard about the technology that we work with in greenfields and brownfields drilling. Uh, this is what we're talking about now is the index technology that we work in in mining. So it comes under the, the title of index mining solutions. Uh, before getting on to the blast hole project in specifically, just a couple of other things we're doing. So we are already quite involved with working with uh, mining operations. Uh, the same technology we use to survey uh, uh, RC holes and diamond holes we use in uphole surveying uh, in underground operations. Uh, and we have another product called the blast hole stabiliser. Uh, so the pictures there, which you can see on the right and the left, one is a blast hole with and one is a blast hole without, obviously. Uh, and if you, have, if you have problems with uh, fall back into holes um, and holes not surviving with a very long uh, sleep time before you can charge them, uh, then this is just a simple product which gets added to the airstream on the blast hole rig, which stabilises the hole. Um, that product alone is successful enough, but we're also working uh, with uh, ACARP and other researchers to increase the capabilities of that material. And a couple of things we're trying to do is modify the material that we're injecting so it can hold water out uh, to increase the sleep time, uh, insulate the explosives from uh, reactive ground. And we're also doing some work because we think in using this additive in the air in the blast hole rigs, you actually get a much better sample for grade control. Now, everyone whinges about sampling cones with um, uh, around blast holes, drilled by blast hole rigs, uh, but because we're going to prevent fra fractionation and the wind blowing the fines away and all of those sorts of things, uh, you will be able to cut out a nice sample, literally like cutting a piece of cake, and get yourself a nice representative sample. So we actually think uh, that that's a driver uh, in its own right. Uh, and one other thing uh, that we're looking here is um, blast hole dipping is the bane of the industry. Uh, we think there are 250,000 blast holes drilled uh, every day, and most of those blast holes are dipped four times before they're, uh, before they're actually blown up. Uh, it's an onerous task, so we're working on an internal project. It's codenamed the PUG. Uh, we're going to come up with an intelligent device, which of course is the opposite of what a pug is, uh, but you can see the pug up there, uh, the real pug, actually has an excellent and rapid dipping device on it, and that's what we're trying to simulate uh, in a mine site. So that's a project uh, under development. Now, uh, just to move on um, to the larger project here, the material logging of blast holes, uh, this project was something that was born out of a water cooler conversation within CRC ore. Uh, it's a really important function that the CRCs fulfil is to bring together different METS companies and then lo and behold you go off and have a cup of coffee and come up with some good ideas. Uh, the delivery theme that we were most interested in when we joined the CRC or was the one called Instrumenting the Bench. Uh, and in fact CRC or, CRC or had us pigeonholed for that uh, right from the start because we've had a long background in dealing with Geomet and, and Geomet Consulting. Uh, now we have access to a whole lot of instrumentation we can put in blast holes so it was a natural fit for us to get involved in the Instrumenting the Bench project. Uh, in the course of being involved with CRC, all we got talking to Orica, which is on the other side of the fence, which is conducting the explosive uh, design work and fragmentation modelling, but I will come back to that. I um, was asked a couple of years ago to give an opinion on instrumenting the bench and why it might be a good thing, and, I, and the analogy I used was, would you get into an aeroplane without any instrumentation on it? Because currently we run a lot of mining operations with very little instrumentation uh, right on the bench. And that's all right when things, things are going just fine and there's no very little variation. Uh, but the analogy, again, is if you get in an aeroplane and it's a fine day and no wind and daylight, it's OK. Uh, but if it's cloudy nighttime and fog overwhelms the airport and you don't have any instrumentation, you're going to crash the plane. Uh, and as an industry, uh, we have a long history of crashing the plane and then not changing anything we do and getting back in and trying to fly it again. So we're trying to just influence a few of those uh, processes that go on. Um, Another bit of background behind this project, this is a talk that was given by David Rose at IMARC uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it was a really good talk, but it was actually quite a negative talk, talking about IoT and mining. And the point he was making that in mining, uh, in the past, we've measured the things that are easy to measure, which aren't necessarily the things that have the greatest value drivers attached to them. The things that have the greatest value drivers attached to them are things that are hard to measure. And he called them spatial and all body factors, Another way of thinking about that is calling it instrumenting the bench, and that's understanding how the materials that we're mining spa uh, vary uh, spatially and with a very high degree of resolution. We just don't know that. So it means that any concepts we have around precision mining, uh, differential sorting to upgrade head grades in the mine, etc. how on earth can you do that if you don't know what's there in the first place? Okay. So this project is aimed at trying to solve that problem. Now, simple concept. Blast holes do, in fact, give us the most spatially dense 3D representation of what we're mining. 
That's why we're dealing with them in this project. The current process, drill and blast, it's pretty simple. It's an industry dominated by rules of thumb. Uh, what we're doing simply is try to insert a little bit of work in between those two processes. I'll just use the pointer here. So uh, drill, then what we want to do is very, at the time of blast hole drilling or very close to it, is log additional information about those blast holes. This is an example that's actually published by Rio Tinto about six years ago. Uh, but it shows here we're using two types of data, rate of penetration from the MWD on the rig and a physically log pyramidal, total count natural gamma down the hole. Now, if you use those two independent variables together, in this case, you can actually map out all of the different rock types. Now, I'm a geologist by background. When I talk to the mining engineers, I say, forget about the rock types. Let's just call them A, B, C and D. All you want to know is what the UCS is and what Young's modulus is, and you're fine. The point is, if we can use these two independent data types to map the, map the presence or absence or where these different materials are, we can tell you where they are on the bench, which means then an explosives design can react to that. So the holes can be charged with different products, they can be charged differentially, stemming can be put uh, in strategically important places to end up with a very consistent outcome at the end of the blast process. So it sounds really simple if you say it quickly, but the point is, and a really critical part of this project, is that everything in that red box needs to just happen automatically. Right? There cannot be any human intervention. No one going and get the data off the rig, going and get the data off the logging tool, putting them together, emailing them somewhere, doing some analytics, handing over the domaining and the result, etc. It just all needs to happen seamlessly. There's not long between drilling the blast holes and taking the shot, and this process needs to fit within that, within that time period. Uh, here's the nice cartoon that illustrates that, the commercial version. Uh, the intention for us is to combine the information we can get down the hole by logging it with the MWD data. Now, MWD data has come up a few times in the course of uh, the last couple of days. The way we look at it, with MWD data, we think whenever we've looked at it, it's been looking like looking through frosted glass. You can see there's something important on the other side, but you often can't tell just what it is with a sufficient degree of reliability. We want to provide another half dozen independent variables to go with the MWD data to give you that sufficient degree of reliability with your predictions. Because what we're predicting is going to be used in a very important application, and that's changing the blasting profile or the blasting plan. So we can't stuff it up. We need to get it right. Um, the other thing to bear in mind here is, you know, is this is a material control model. It is not an ore, ore control model or an ore grade model. So we know there are ore models already. What we're building here is a far higher spatial resolution material control model, model, which will also be mapping out and combining the fractures with that as well. So it has all sorts of uh, implications. So, you know, we are currently modelling, we're hatching another project with CRC or now using the integrated extraction simulator, which we're going to front end with um, instrumenting the bench type inputs and actually model the downstream benefits that should arise from that. And we've done a little bit of modelling already. They're the sorts of results you get. Uh, but here's a real world example. This is a single copper concentrator in a large copper porphyry deposit. It had two systematic problems, one related to throughput and one related to recovery. Those two problems combined uh, cost, the, just with that single circuit, cost $365 million in one year. And it's all preventable. And we think it comes down to not being able to track the presence or absence of clay throughout the deposit and throughout the process. We'll be able to tell you where those materials are so you can react to it. So it's an ongoing project. We're working on it. We're, we're having to start from scratch. There's nothing off the shelf that works, so we're into it. So we're building uh, instrumentation. Uh, that's uh, some simulated blast holes that we can go out and log. This is in our engineering office in California. Um, if you can see in the background there, that's a vineyard. So it's a horrible place to have to go and work. Uh, to try these materials out. Uh, and just a last thing, there's been, again, a lot said about analytics, and I really like this slide. Um, the way it gets banded around the industry, you'd think it removes the actual requirement to think. Uh, it doesn't. Um, successful application of analytics actually is a long and time-consuming process, and you never leave it run unattended for any significant period of time. You need to go and tune it and make sure it's giving you expected outcomes. Um, and just a couple of last comments here. So this project has actually also turned into a very large uh, METS ignited project. Uh, so uh, uh, Rick Gross and Peter Clark came around to see us late last year. We put in an application because um, it really fitted very squarely as what we're trying to do get to get two 
MET's companies to work together to provide a new solution to the industry that the industry is willing to pay for, to put it in shorthand. And so Index and Oric are right now doing the paperwork. We have Anglo and Tech signed up to this project as well. Uh, all up, that's worth about a couple of million dollars. That's by no means the total spend going to this project. That's a fraction of it. But it really helps and it puts everyone's skin in the game to make sure things go along and progress. Um, in the background, I've also been talking to Atlas Copco or EpiRock uh, throughout the course of this and also Sequent from the DOS software side as well. So it really is, it's a very large uh, METS collaborative project um, serving the big end of town, the big end of mining, big end of town. Uh, I'm just going to leave you with one quote here, and this is from Orica, actually, this is from Alberto Calderon in the Fin Review in January, and I think that's a very good uh, summation of where we're going um, with this part of the process, at least in mining operations. All right, thanks for your time.